Howdy everybody, John Michael with you. Do you have joy in your life? You know, Pope Francis has written the joy of the gospel and we're gonna be looking at that. All things are possible with God. Howdy everybody, John Michael with you. You know, joy is possible and good news is possible. We're surrounded in a world of bad news. We hear it all over the airwaves, from the media, from the TV, you know, on the internet. Jesus brings good news and Jesus brings joy. So the Pope, Pope Francis, has written this wonderful, wonderful apostolic letter, the joy of the gospel the joy of the gospel. And we're gonna be looking at this, but we're gonna set this up, the first couple of programs. We're gonna take a look at some scriptures. We're gonna take a look at some Greek words on joy and good news. So this first segment right now is, do you have joy in your life? Do you have joy? Is it personal? Is it life-changing? Is it powerful? That's the real question. Well, I wanna look at some scriptures. Nehemiah chapter eight, verse 10 says, this day is holy unto the Lord. Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, when you have joy, you're filled with, with strength. You're empowered. You're inspired. When you don't have joy, uh, you, you lose your power. You lose your fire. You lose your effectiveness. So the joy of the Lord is your strength. We're going to be looking at Pope Francis's apostolic letter, The Joy of the Gospel. Where do we get this tradition of, of reading the letter of a pope or a bishop or a church leader? Shouldn't scripture just be enough? But listen to what St. Paul says in his letter to the Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. He says, And when this letter is read before you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And you yourselves read the one from them. So apparently there was a tradition in the early church of exchanging letters that came from the apostles, that came from the successors to the apostles. They, they shared letters with each other. So it is appropriate to read the letter of the Bishop of Rome, of the Pope, because... <laughs> It's scriptural. Just reading the letters, even though it is not scripture, it is scriptural. Okay, so that's where we're going to be looking at this. Now, first of all, you know, this Pope, Pope Francis, he is exactly the right guy for the right time at this period in history. I'm so excited about Pope Francis. You know, we need renewal and reform in the church. And I think we've got just the guy that the Holy Spirit has picked to bring it. And the whole world is excited about Pope Francis. Not only Roman Catholics. Hey, you can see evangelicals, Pentecostals talking about Pope Francis like crazy. We call it the Francis effect. It's very real. You know, at the election of the Pope, I knew something was up because suddenly the Pope walks out on the balcony and he's not wearing the usual vestments that a Pope wears at that first introduction. All he had on was this little white cassock, which, is, which goes back to the Dominican community. So he's, he's wearing a plain cassock, no liturgical vestment. And he asked the people to bless him before he blesses them. And I said, oh baby, something is up. We're in for a ride. And Pope Francis has been just wowing us, not with anything extraordinary. All he does is he's like Jesus. And so Catholics and non-Catholics, believers and unbelievers are excited about this guy. And then what does he do? And he just did it again this year for two years in a row. He washed feet, not of cardinals, but of 
first year, he takes people from the youth detention center and he washes the feet of these young people. Some of them, some of them are men, some of them are women. Some of them are Christians, one of them is a Muslim. Whew. Suddenly the Pope is saying, I am not here to be served. I'm here to serve. And it's so visible. And it's so beautiful. I just think it's so cool. I have friends in religious communities in Rome. And when the Pope goes to visit a religious community, he drives, he doesn't come in a big limousine or a Pope mobile or anything like that. When, when Pope Francis went to go visit the Camaldolese, he drove himself in a little Ford Focus. <laughs> How cool is that? So, you know, this is just, just, just so simple. He's showing us how to be Jesus. And, you know, they say that in South America, when he was the Cardinal Archbishop, down there in Argentina, he would go and he would hang out with a guy they call the South American Billy Graham. His name is Luis Paolo. And he, he's a great evangelical preacher. And the Pope would go to his meetings. So immediately, even before he was the Pope, when he was the Cardinal Archbishop, he would, he would what? He would go to the meetings of the great preachers, of the great evangelists, and he would show his support. So when he became, when he was elected the Bishop of Rome, you know, this evangelical evangelist, he said, this is going to be good, and it is. You know, we also know that he sent an iPhone selfie to the Kenneth Copeland Ministries, a Pentecostal, non-Catholic guy. And they had a leadership conference. And the Pope sent a little iPhone message to the Kenneth Copeland, the Pentecostal ministry. That in many ways you could say, oh, they're so different from Catholics. No, the Pope reached out. He reached out. And he didn't come off like, oh, I'm, I'm the leader of the biggest religious community in the world. No, he started out by saying, I'm here as your little brother. Whew. You know, the Pope is called uh, the Papa. It's a title that was used in the early church and is still used today, not only of the Bishop of Rome, it's used of other archbishops, of other patriarchs. Where do we get this language? Didn't Jesus said, call no one father but God? Well, he did, but St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, he says of the church there, I am jealous of you with the jealousy of God since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm the father, the spiritual father, and I'm presenting you to Jesus who will be your spouse. The Pope is also called a pontiff. The word pontiff, it's like a pontoon bridge. He's a bridge builder. So it's appropriate for us to look at what the Pope is teaching, not only as Catholics, but also Catholics and non-Catholics alike, because he has this way of bridging differences. And we can see it with evangelicals, Pentecostals, you know, Catholics, Orthodox, Eastern Christians. Somehow, this guy is setting the world on fire. What's he doing? He's not changing doctrine. He's not unorthodox. All this Pope is doing is showing us how to be humble followers of Jesus. And he's doing it in a graphic way. You know, I figure that if the most powerful religious leader in the world can do all this stuff, uh, so can I. I can take a lesson from him. And what about our church leaders, Catholic and non-Catholic alike? He's teaching us some things. So we're going to come back and we're going to be looking at his letter and we're going to be looking at the word joy. Do you have joy in your life? You know, Pope Francis is challenging us. Let's find the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. I'll be right back with you. I love you guys. See you in a bit. Holy Spirit, Lord of life. 
life from the clear celestial height thy pure beaming radiance give come thou father of the poor come with treasures to endure come thou light of all that live light immortal light divine visit now these hearts of thine and our inmost being fill for without your grace all turns to ill Veni Sancte Spiritus Veni Sancte Veni Sancte Spiritus means come Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Spirit in our life, Jesus remains only just a good idea or a good religious founder. It's through the power of the Spirit that Jesus becomes a personal reality for us, an intimate reality for us, a life-changing reality for us. So as I sing, you can sing along if you want or just pray, but ask the Holy Spirit to truly be alive in your life so that all the areas of our Christian faith will become powerful and life-changing. Veni Sancte Spiritus. Veni Sancte Spiritus. Veni Sancte Sancte Spiritus. Heal our wounds, our strength renew. On our dryness pour thy dew. Wash the stain of our guilt away. Bend our stubborn heart and will, melt the frozen on the chill. Guide our steps when we go astray. Sing with me now. Veni Sancte Spiritus. Veni Sancte Spiritus. Veni Sancte Howdy everybody, John Michael. We are looking at the joy of the gospel. And in this little segment, I want to look at the word joy. What does it mean? What does it mean? 
Well, there's some wonderful Greek words that are used in Scripture, and let's just go through them real quick. The first is joy. Kara. Kara. Now, by the way, as we look to these Greek words, there are different ways to pronounce the Greek words, but Biblical Greek is called Koine Greek. In a sense, it's a dead language. So there, you will hear different schools of thought pronouncing different uh, Greek words and letters in different ways. So I'm going to kind of get to the simple way. I want you to say that with me. Kara. Kara. It means joy. There's another word that's similar. Cairo. Cairo. It means rejoice. Rejoice. So kara, Cairo. Another word that this is very similar to is charis which means gift. Charis is where we get charismatic. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a charismatic Catholic. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm excited. I love the power of the Spirit. So the word joy is related to the word gift and related to the charismatic power of the Spirit in our life. There's another word that's important, and it's charisomai. Charisomai. And it means to pardon, to forgive. That forgiveness, to pardon, is a gift. And it's related to another word, that which is very important to high church Christians, liturgical Christians, sacramental Christians. The word is Eucharist. Eucharist. So the notion of joy is there. We see it in joy, in rejoicing, in the gifts of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit of God. We can see it in forgiving, and we can see it in the sacramental life of the Eucharist. Do we have joy in our Eucharist, in our liturgy? Do we have joy when we pardon, when we forgive? Do we rejoice in the Lord always? Again, I say rejoice. Do we have the power of the Spirit in our life? And indeed, it says in Acts 13.52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. See? And we know, of course, this famous passage, Galatians 5, 22, The fruit of the Spirit. The pneuma in Greek is love, joy, but others, peace, patience, kindness, mildness, chastity or self-control, and faith against such there is no law. Now the interesting thing about these words is they are both subjective, which is an experience, and objective, which is a truth that is factual. So it involves fact and feeling. <clears throat> so the joy of the Lord is a subjective experience, but it also has objective consequences. Furthermore, that objective consequence stirs up more of the Spirit of God in our life, which stirs up what? More joy. More joy. So are we open to that power of the Spirit? How do we get that power of the Spirit? St. Paul's letter to the Galatians goes on. He says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us now follow the Spirit's lead. It's tied to the cross, bringing the old self, the old person that's not joyful, to the foot of the cross, let that person die so that we can rise up a new creation in Christ, filled with joy. That old self, that old unhappy man or woman, the one that doesn't make us happy, the one that frankly, if you're noticing, probably doesn't make the people around you very happy either. We bring that person to the cross and we let it go. We let it die. And when we let it die, suddenly we rise up a new person rises up, and we become the person that God created us to be when we were conceived in our mother's wombs. The person that we've lost. The person that might have gone to sleep. The person that got mislaid somewhere along the lines. 
Whew. And now we can rise up a new creation in Christ. Paul writes to Timothy, For this reason I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a power and love and self-control. The spirit has been given to us in so many ways, but you got to stir it up every day. Stir up that power of the spirit. Are we truly learning how to stir up the power of the spirit of God? Are we letting go of the old self? Are we entering into the sacramental life, the Eucharist? Are we forgiving each other? Oh, when you don't forgive somebody, it makes you miserable. It makes them miserable. You bind them up and you bind yourself up. When you forgive, man, the power of the Spirit gets freed up and you're happy and you set them free too. Are you forgiving? Let's find these ways to, to truly stir up the power of the Spirit. Then we will have joy in our life. Joy, love, peace that the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. Jesus, fill us with your Spirit. Bring us joy. Bring us joy. That's my prayer for you guys today. I love you. I'll see you next time. We're going to be looking at are we good news or bad news. Joy makes us good news for all the world.
worship and bow down to kneel before our Maker. We are the people, the sheep of His flock. Come, let us worship the Lord.